The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. Our job is to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. Today's hearing is a con part of a continuing series of field hearings done throughout the country to reach out and hear from American people outside the Beltway about what their challenges are with the Affordable Care Act. In Washington, we brought in specialists from all over the country to deal with failures of the website, unintended consequences of changes in the law, the effects in some cases, and Mr. Franks and I worked particularly on the effects of changes made by the President that may not be within his constitutional authority. But here we're, we've come to listen to people who are directly affected by the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. I want to note for the record, these are bipartisan hearings no different than Washington. However, so far, three out of three times, my Democratic colleagues have chosen not to participate or even ask for a witness to support an alternate point of view. I regret that. America is best served when all opinions are heard. For that reason, we will include any insertions by individuals who have different stories in the record. We want to know where the Affordable Care Act is doing good, in addition to the areas in which it is causing higher cost or driving people out of the health care they wanted. I want to particularly thank today uh, Congressman Gosar because we're here in Apache Junction, Junction thanks to the city and the county, but also thanks to the congressman who helped so much in arranging this. Congressman Gosar is now becoming a senior member of the committee. He is highly involved in the day-to-day -day of the committee and is one of our most constant participants both during and outside of the hearing process. Additionally, I want to welcome and ask unanimous consent that Mr. Franks be allowed to participate in this hearing even though he's not a member of the committee and without objection that is so ordered. The fact is, while the President and other authors of the Affordable Care Act repeatedly promised, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep him. Simply isn't turning out to be true. No more than those who were told that there was oceanfront property here in Phoenix. The fact is, no matter what you were promised, the stark reality of far more people losing their health care than getting a replacement health care. Far less people finding the asset versus the liability of the Affordable Care Act. It doesn't change the fact that a law is a law and we are sworn to uphold and defend the Constitution and the statutes as they are passed. For that reason, we want to know what is wrong, what is happening, and propose legislation that would allow us to find a way to bring what was the stated purpose of the Affordable Care Act, which was affordable care, to the American people. All three of us on the dais here today share one common view, and that is that government intervention government's attempt to usurp the private sector. Uh, thank you. And you, you, by unanimous consent, you also will be included. Approving you let anyone sit down with you. <laughs> Especially if you're local and popular. <clears throat> the fact is, we have this obligation and we are here today to help fulfill it. For every individual reported that reported the Affordable Care Act enrollment in a state or fed and federal exchanges, more have received cancellation notices. We are not limiting our investigation to government agencies and government intentions and government meddling in what was already a difficult and expensive private sector market. 
We also, the committee has sent to 15 insurance companies asking them what did they know and when did they know it. Clearly, the cancellations that are coming now were known well before October 1st and were not made available to American people. I have no doubt if the American people had known the level of cancellations, the lack of availability, the fact that the promise that you could keep the health care plan you had when in fact in every state they are disappearing and in my state, California, they re were required to disappear by agreement with the state regulatory agency in order to participate in the new government exchange sponsored by California. So here we are in Arizona where in many ways you're fortunate, at least you think you are, because you don't have a state exchange further meddling and implementing Obamacare, but you do have the fact that the Affordable Care Act, which promised to give you more choice and more competition, didn't. According to research from Heritage Foundation, this is very recent, uh, there are currently 11 insurers offering coverage in, in the Arizona individual market. This decrease in market competition in Arizona will lead to higher cost of health insurance. The fact is, <clears throat> the exchanges have signed up only 738 people in the federal exchange in the first, first month of operation. Well, in fact, the Manhattan Institute published a state-by-state -state analysis of the impact of the Affordable Care Act premiums. According to this report, in the average state, the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, will increase underlying payments by 41 percent. However, in Arizona, the Manhattan Institute estimates at least 51 percent increase in the first year. One of the challenges the Affordable Care Act constantly has is you go online or you talk to your insurer and they do have a program that costs somewhat similar to your previous year. Then you discover that your out-of-pocket costs have risen, the amount you pay before anything gets paid, by two, three, four thousand, five thousand dollars $5,000. We did not sign up for an affordable care that simply said the insurance rate will be about the same and you will get less coverage and you will have more out-of-pocket expenses. And, yes, that, and yet that's what we're finding again and again. Predictable but unintended, when you write a law that says individuals working under 30 hours a week need not be covered by the mandatory health care, even though they have a mandatory responsibility to buy. This is a double whammy. Part-time employees at places like Starbucks and others who previously had health care may not have it, and yet they have a mandate to buy it, worst of all worlds. Lastly, most people here in Arizona know that the biggest source for employment will in fact be companies who employ less than 50 individuals. And all startups uh, that are really truly startups start with less than 50 employees. And yet that very group exempted from it means that as the prices go up, it's less affordable. Many individuals in companies, small businesses less than 50, who previously had plans, often with health savings accounts and other benefits they like, are losing them. Again, unintended consequences of government intervention. When, president, when the President's signature law, the Affordable Care Act, was passed three and a half years ago along 100 percent partisan lines, the Act gave the administration virtually unlimited funds to do what it wanted, and more than three years later, time to complete all their work. Well, the control was all theirs, so in fact is the question why is it in sworn testimony before this committee no one would take direct responsibility for any of the failures of the healthcare.gov website? In fact, we had two chief information officers, both of whom said they had nothing to, to really do with it other than showing up to meetings. That kind of passing the buck, in addition to the, what you will hear today about the as adverse effects to people seeking care, has to be changed. The Affordable Care Act will require legislative changes. We believe it requires legislative changes in order to get government responsible with your money. The launch of one of the more famous websites, the eBay auction house, over more than six years spent approximately $300 million and conducted millions 
and millions of real-time live auctions for a fraction of the cost of the failed affordable care site. That's just the tip of the iceberg of what happens when government gets your money and is not held accountable to the American people. Today, we'll do the best we can to bring transparency to the failures of the Affordable Care Act so the American people can begin appropriately demanding that we take action to fix a broken law. And with that, I go to uh, Congressman Gosar for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairman. First, I would like to thank Chairman Issa for making the trip to Arizona and holding today's hearing. I strongly believe congressional committees should periodically come out to its members' home states and hear directly from our constituents regarding the struggles that they face from the policies that Congress enacts. I know there are a lot of demands on your time as well as the committee's time, and I'm deeply appreciated and honored that we be able to hold this field hearing here in Arizona's 4th Congressional District. I'd also like to thank my two colleagues, uh, Congressman Trent Franks and David Schweikert, for taking time out of their busy Friday uh, for this hearing. But it is an important hearing in regards to health, which all of us have to have some concerns about. And we are all committed to repealing this onerous law and replacing it with policies that increase access to care while decreasing premiums. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for holding us accountable coming out on your Friday and being part of a, a democratic republic um, that holds your elected officials accountable. I know a lot of people could not be here from the long distances, but as the chairman said, we would love to have your stories be brought into the record. And you can reach out to my staff. Penny Pugh is in the front, off, front uh, room if you would like to direct your stories accordingly. But we're about understanding what's actually happening with the, what I call the Unaffordable Care Act. Over the past few months, my office has been inundated by cell phone, by calls, emails, tweets, and Facebook posts from Arizonans frustrated with the Obamacare implementation. Since its enactment, the President has made a variety of promises to the American people that have not been frankly true. These folks are now dealing with lo uh, lots of problems, lack of choices, higher premiums, higher co-pays, and less access to care than, that they need. In rural Arizona, these struggles are particularly amplified in communities that simply already have limited access to health care providers and an unemployment rate that exceeds the state and nationwide average. Obamacare is a train wreck full of broken promises that it's increasing, increasingly health, increasing health care costs and interfering with the doctor-patient relationship. Obamacare must be repealed and most re importantly replaced. That's why I, I am not shy about saying there is a replacement and I've been very form foremost part of that replacement. I, I worked along six of my House Republican health care colleagues for our replacement plan called the American Health Care Reform Act, and it's H.R. 3121 if you'd like to find it. This is something I'm not shy about. This initiative does five principal things. It starts with a patient-centered, patient-friendly health care, not a government dictated. It spurs competition to lower health care costs by allowing Americans to purchase health care insurance across state lines and enabling small businesses to pull together and get the same buying power as large corporations. It starts with tax reform, reforms medical malpractice laws in a common sense way that limits trial lawyer fees and non-economic damages while maintaining strong protections for the patient. It also takes into account tax reforms, which provides tax reforms that allow families and individuals to deduct health care costs just like companies do, leveling the playing field and providing all Americans with a standard deduction for health care insurance. It expands access to health savings accounts, HSAs, increasing the amount of pre-tax dollars individuals can deposit in portable savings accounts to be used for health care expenses. And it safeguards individuals with pre-existing conditions from being discriminated against purchasing health insurance by bolstering state-based high-risk pools and extending HIPAA guarantees uh, for availability of protections. Our bill opens up the market, allowing Americans to purchase health insurance across state lines, and it drives down the cost expands access to these health savings accounts that are part of patients' budgets. This bill is pragmatic, it's practical, and portable. Free market alternatives to the current health care system that does not impose more taxes and mandates on American families. It facilitates a system that leaves patients and physicians in the driver's seats where they belong. It has garnered the support of the majority of my Republican colleagues in the House, and I hope we will ultimately enact it into law. Thank you again, everyone, for coming out here today. It is a pleasure to see so many smiling faces. I think with the blue sky, there's a smiling face everywhere in Arizona. And Mr. Uh, Chairman, we actually did buy oceanfront property in Arizona. And I yield back.
We now go to my friend and fellow member of the Judiciary <coughs> Committee and Chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I will do like so many have done uh, whenever they sit on a committee with you, and that is to express uh, their own appreciation for your leadership. And, uh, you know, it's uh, not an easy thing being the captain of accountability in the Congress. Uh, it's uh, something that brings with it great uh, uh, criticism from many corners, and it's very hard to be um, uh, intense enough to, to maintain true accountability and still uh, maintain uh, integrity in the process, but uh, Chairman Darrell Issa has uh, done that in an exemplary way, and I, I appreciate him deeply, and I think that this country uh, will have a better hope and a better future for his having uh, come uh, the way of Washington, D.C. And I would also like to express uh, gratitude to David Schweikert and to uh, Paul Gosar. Uh, these are not only fellow colleagues in Congress from Arizona, but they are precious friends. Uh, we are so fortunate uh, that our delegation, at least uh, those represented on this dais, uh, have a, a sincere commonality uh, and comity toward each other and uh, commitment to this country. And I would suggest to you that if, uh, if uh, the rest of Congress reflected the philosophy and, and the, the heart that uh, Paul Gosar and David Schweikert have, uh, and Chairman I said that I would simply be inclined to come home and be with my children more. Uh, because I could, I could do that with uh, a clear conscience. Uh, today, the, the subject primarily is the Affordable Care Act, and I'll do, be pretty brief here. Um, some of the things have already been uh, expressed uh, very eloquently by our chairman, uh, but Mr. Obama famously and repeatedly promised Americans who liked their health care plans that they could keep them. Now, as of November 19th, nearly 5 million health insurance policies in 32 states have already uh, been canceled, and uh, there are indications that that is the tip of the iceberg. He said if you liked your doctors, you could keep them. Uh, now we see stories in the Washington Post about insurers uh, restricting the doctors and hospitals available to patients in order to keep the costs from the Affordable Care Act down, or Obamacare down. Mr. Obama promised to lower premiums by up to $2,500 per family. But an analysis by the Manhattan Institute, as Chairman Issa said, showed that on the average, Obamacare will increase premiums by 41 percent. It's especially important to repeat that in Arizona, that rate is, is 51 percent. Uh, that's pretty profound for something that was to save us money. The price tag for this dramatic worsening of our health care system, a $2 trillion increase in federal spending over the next 10 years. Now, I will just have to say to you, uh, for the leader of the free world to make those statements and then to back away from them or to, to, to see them clearly uh, in error before the entire country either reflects an error in judgment or a lapse in judgment on his part or veracity. One of the two or both. And uh, in either case, they represent a significant issue to the American people. If both are true, then the implications are, are fairly sobering, especially when we begin to uh, see negotiations going forward with the Islamic Republic of Iran on the potential of jihad gaining uh, potential access to nuclear weapons. Uh, it is a very significant thing for the people of this country. We have two choices, uh, two ways to try to see good policy come about. We either have to elect the right people or we have to try to encourage the wrong people to do right things. And I would suggest to you that that uh, latter uh, equation is the one before us now. We have to try to see if we can get this administration to go in a better direction. With that, I believe that uh, there is a hope out there that the courts will act on the unconstitutionality uh, in many areas of the Affordable Care Act. In 2010, the Supreme Court held Obamacare as a tax. The origination clause of the Constitution, found in Article I, Section 7 of the Constitution, states, quote, all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. I will say to you that that goes back to the very uh, genesis of our Constitution. Uh, it is what allowed us to come together as a country and actually have a Constitution in the first place to make sure that government's most coercive, most potentially dangerous power, that of taxation, was kept in the body that was most responsive to the people and where the people had the ability 
to uh, make their voice known as quickly as possible, that being the House of Representatives. We never would have had the Constitution come together. There never would have been a compromise uh, at that time for the Constitution that we have to actually exist apart from that uh, clause. Now, in creating Obamacare, the Senate took an entirely unrelated bill that did not raise tax revenues, that was not germane to the Affordable Care Act, and struck everything but the number and injected the Affordable Care Act and calling it the Senate Health Care Act. Every provision of Obamacare originated in the Senate. And uh, some of us now, uh, there are 43 of us that have signed amicus briefs before the, uh, the circuit court in Washington, D.C. to try to challenge that on constitutional grounds. If the Senate in the future can take any bill and strike all of its contents and raise taxes uh, as high as the Affordable Care Act has done, in some cases the people suggest that it's the highest tax increase in history, if they can do that, then the origination clause, my friends, is a dead letter. It has no place anymore in the Constitution. So they have a pretty stark choice before them. Uh, with that, uh, I still have uh, some hope. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, president is now trying to stack the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals with nominees, and the Senate has acquiesced with that effort in doing what they call the nuclear option to make it to where Republicans or the minority does not have the, uh, the say in in a confirmation process as they once did. But I still believe that we have great hope and I, my judgment uh, is that the American people are a lot more uh, in control of their faculties than some uh, politicians think and uh, I hope that uh, as Winston Churchill said, you know, the American people always do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possibility. And uh, my hope is that we've now seen that we've exhausted some of our possibilities with this administration and we need to do everything that we can to change direction. With that, I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman, for your forbearance and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I welcome all of you. I'm grateful that each person is here. Thank you. Thank you. It's often said that if you, uh, if you ask a carpenter to do something for you, undoubtedly it'll include a hammer and a saw. So when you bring a constitutional scholar and someone that's worked so much on that issue, there's no question what will be part of the solution. And with that, going to Congressman Swikert, who is a defender of small business, a leader on the small business committee in addition to science, uh, I have no doubt that uh, his knowledge of the impact to Arizona business is unparalleled. Yeah. Mr. Swikert. In, uh, Mr. Chairman, Darrell, it's fun to have you out here. Um, sorry about the beachfront crack. <laughs> but we are waiting for the earthquake where we do get the beachfront property. But we only know that it'll split. We don't know if we'll both get an ocean out of it. <laughs> you know, I'm willing, to, I'm willing to split the difference with you. Um, and, and thank the question you is, who gets the river? <laughs> oh, don't start that. Please don't start that. Um, those of you who know Arizona history, we once had to send our army to, all 12 of them, to the border to keep them from stealing our water. And to Paul and Trent, and we have something unique in Arizona right now, at least on our side, you actually have a delegation that actually likes each other. Would you be amazed how much easier it is to work <laughs> when you have teams around you that actually play nice? Um, uh, uh, Daryl, and, and for everyone that's here, thank you. You're actually in one of the most beautiful pieces of desert, I think, in the country. Um, I think it was on Wednesday, we held an oversight hearing in small business. And you know, much of the discussion here today will be about your access to your doctor, your affordability of your health care. We held a hearing on something they call the business aggregation rule and what it's doing in a cascade effect of crushing small businesses. So you have a business, you invest in your son's business, and as a family partnership, you put a little money in their subway shop and do this, you have to keep track of all the number of employees and everything you're touching, and if you hit the 50 rule, 50 people, all your businesses now fall into the new command and control system. And we had a series of testimony, even the witness for the Democrats agreed that this was stifling growth and crushing small businesses, and now CPAs and advisors all over the country are advising people saying, you can't even invest with your kids anymore for the danger it might have to the current businesses. 
the layer after layer after layer that we're discovering, or at least we're finally now getting um, our friends, our brothers and sisters in the media to start reaching out and helping us expose. There's so much more to come. Um, wait till the beginning of the new year when you start to see what's happened to the actuarial portfolios of uh, the distribution of risk within our healthcare industries mm -hmm. and what's going to be happening there. Um, I think actually we may have done incredible damage to our future markets and our future availability to healthcare. Um, and at least we're finally getting help from both the media but also from the public reaching out saying, I'm embracing, I'm starting to understand what we've been talking about for the last couple of years. And now with what's happening to so many of our brothers and sisters around us, sadly enough, you're getting to experience. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. All members may have seven days in which to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. Additionally, the record will be open for participation of individuals uh, here today uh, to submit information for that same seven days. Uh, pursuant to the rule, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, and the gentleman also from Arizona, Mr. Swikert, be allowed to participate in this hearing and ask questions without objection, so ordered. We now welcome our panel of witnesses. Normally, when we introduce people in Washington, we're introducing them with lofty titles, PhDs, although we do have an MD here. And the story is what institute, what association, what think tank are you from? Here today, the most important part of the introduction is where is the city you're from more than, in fact, any, t any other title. We're honored to have Mrs. Julie Dalton from Prescott, Arizona, Ms. Diana Robinson from Chino Valley, Arizona, Dr. Stephen Montgomery, who is a veterinarian from Blythe, California, and Mrs. Christy Hammond, from, also from Prescott, Arizona. This is an, a, a, a hearing, and pursuant to our rules, all members must be sworn. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give here today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. We, uh, we have a, a little machine up here, and it's, uh, it's universally understood. Green means go as long as you want. Yellow means hurry up through the intersection, and yellow means stop on the other side of the intersection. So if you'd please stay as close to those lights as I'm sure you did driving here today, it would be appreciated. <laughs> and with that, I believe we're starting with Mrs. Dalton. Thank you. Um, as you said, my name is Julie Dalton. I'm 46 years old. I come from Prescott, Arizona. My husband and I live there. We have three, three children there. Um, we're very active in our community and in our church, and we believe that it's a sacred obligation to take care of ourselves, as reflected in our own Declaration of Independence, that we have the God-given right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness, and to provide for ourselves and our own in the way that we see fit and the way that we feel is best. In that spirit of self-reliance, we decided in 2011 um, that we needed to purchase health insurance for our family. Um, we felt uncertain about the future. We didn't know what Obamacare was going to hold for us, and so we thought that it was prudent that we should get ourselves prepared and, and purchase a plan. Our president had assured us that if we had a plan that we liked, that we could keep it. And so we felt that it was prudent to go ahead and provide that for our family. What he didn't tell us was that in 2010, there was a deadline that if we didn't meet that, we would not be grandfathered in. Uh, we didn't understand that. That was never made clear to us. Our agent worked very hard to help us find something that was just right for us. Um, we chose a plan that had a $375 premium. Under this plan, our children were covered until they were 30 years old, which is better than what we're being told Obamacare provides. We already had that. We had better than that. Each member of the family had a $5 million cap on benefits. We felt very secure about that. Prescription coverage was good. We were healthy, and we had exactly what we needed. In October of this year, our agent called us, and this is interesting. It wasn't Blue Cross Blue Shield that called us. It was our agent that informed us that we were about to lose the plan that we had worked so hard to find. Through the Affordable Care Act, it was no longer going to be made available to us. 
He told us that starting the first of the year, our cost would be $1,180 a month, which is calculated to be a 320% increase over what we worked so hard to provide for ourselves. Um, he offered to rewrite the plan for us so that we could at least buy seven months. So we were redu reduced to planning for our family seven months at a time. Uh, since then, the rules have changed again, and we were informed that Blue Cross is now extending the renewal date to December 31st of 2014, which is great, but that means six days after Christmas next year, we're going to receive that huge increase in our premium. I was asked to comment on how these things impact our family. We could opt to pay the 320% increase in our premium in 2014, but that would be an 800 additional dollars a month that have to come out of the family budget. I'd like to impress upon you what the value is to us of $800. It means that we would have to sell both of our cars, or we could opt to sell our home and move in with my brother-in-law. We could get a second and third job to pay for health insurance. I could choose to save money by never going to see my dad again, who lives far away. We could suspend all charitable giving, which is substantial for our family, and we feel that that's a sacred obligation that we take seriously. None of these options are workable. We could opt to purchase insurance through the government subsidized exchanges, but for a family of four at our income level living in Yavapai County, the subsidy is only $252 a month, which would still mean that we would experience a 250% increase if we were to purchase on the exchanges. Additionally, in Yavapai County, we've been informed that three of the five major insurance carriers operating in Arizona have pulled out of the exchanges in Yavapai County completely, which, which effectively reduces our ability to find good competitive pricing on the exchange by 75%. To stay within our budget, we could choose to drop our insurance altogether and pay the penalty. This looks good on paper, but the reality is that when my husband and I do get sick, which now in our middle age is more and more likely as we go along, um, serious disease has the potential to completely wipe us out financially, and in the end, we could lose everything. In short, at this point, we have no good options. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Robinson. Thank you. When I first learned about Obamacare several years ago, I was hopeful but suspicious. All I could do was wait and see how it would affect me. At the beginning of this year, the first warning sign of things to come arrived in the mail when my then insurer, United Healthcare, informed me that my premiums would be doubling. Knowing that I could not afford a higher rate, I found the insurance I currently have, which is a policy with Humana for $280 per month with a $5,000 deductible, which is barely affordable. When healthcare.gov was made available, I got online to find out what I would be looking at when the Affordable Care Act took effect. I was stunned. The premiums were well out of my budget, and that was just for the bronze plans. Since my annual income falls under the $46,000 cap, I then applied for a subsidy, which I did not want to do. I was happy with my Humana policy and didn't want to take government aid for something I did not want in the first place. I submitted the information on October 31st, Halloween, which is a fitting day to, to do so since I was quickly learning how scary Obamacare really was. Then I waited, and I waited. After multiple phone calls to healthcare.gov, I finally learned last Tuesday that I do qualify for a subsidy of $226 per month. After reviewing the marketplace plans, I would be able to get insurance for $529 per month, which, minus the subsidy, would cost me, <coughs> excuse me, $303, slightly over my current plan. This sounded feasible until I compared the proposed plan and my current one. Maximum out-of-pocket for the ACA plan would cost me $1,350 more per year with an additional $276 in premiums. Why would I want to change? Needless to say, I'm choosing to keep my current plan until the end of 2014 when I will be forced to change. So much for the, if you like your current plan, you can keep it promise. In the meantime, I received a letter from Humana telling me that I had two options for 2014 if I wanted to keep my policy with them. 
I could keep my current plan at $280 per month or switch to an ACA compliant policy at $738 per month, or excuse me, per, yes, per month. I was shocked. Uh, again, needless to say, I will be sticking with my current policy. More disturbing, the difference in the premiums between the two plans was $5,547.12. Another significant issue for me is that my income was greatly reduced one year ago when I became single. I'm now faced with the possibility of going back to work. However, doing so would most likely push me over the annual $46,000 subsidy cap, eliminating my subsidy. I would then be working mainly to pay for my health care premiums. I now realize the Affordable Care Act has been misnamed, and I agree with you, Representative Kosar. It should have been renamed the Unaffordable Health Care Act. Thank you for allowing me to share my story, and I am so grateful to have gentlemen such as you representing us. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Uh, Dr. Montgomery. Uh, thank you. Um, I enrolled in the American Veterinary Medical Association Group Health and Life Insurance Trust Health Insurance Program upon graduation from veterinary school in 1983. I also started a health savings account in connection with the plan when they first became available. The trust plan was a bona fide association plan, a designation given to it by some governmental agency. And it's available to AVMA members and their families. The policies were underwritten by a major insurance company, most recently New York Life, whose participation in the healthcare market is limited to association plans. The policies were good ones. They were affordable, they were comprehensive, and they were portable. One could see any doctor go to any hospital anywhere. This is quite important to me as I have lived and practiced in four locations in three states in the last 30 years. For the past 24 years, I have lived in a very rural area of Southern California on the border of Arizona. The nearest towns to mine and where my doctors and hospital are located are in Arizona. Late last year, we were informed by the trust that New York Life was no longer going to underwrite the plan as of January 1st of 2014. The reasons given, one, that our association was no longer bona fide, it had been stripped of that status by the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> and two, since New York Life was going to start, was providing health care to some, it was going to have to start providing it for everyone. New York Life has completely withdrawn from the health insurance business, formally. Attempts by the trust to secure another underwriter have been unsuccessful. When the Affordable Care Act was first announced, I was not that concerned, as President Obama and prominent members of Congress stated emphatically that you could keep your current health insurance. They were wrong and they should have known that. I, should, I would perhaps excuse Ms. Pelosi since she had not yet read the bill, but ignorance, even in my profession, is a poor excuse. I have not yet secured new health insurance for myself and my granddaughter. My wife and I are her legal guardians. I have not worked too hard to do so, but it, looking on the internet at what's available has so far been disappointing. I currently pay about $6,300 per year for the two of us. Minimum premiums will go up to $7,400. Comparable plans up to $9,000. But the most important thing is the out-of-pocket expenses, co-pays, deductibles, are going to be almost three times as much. And if I go out of network, such as crossing state lines, which I'm not certain if that's going to work or not, could be eight to nine times as much as I'm paying now. Looking at the, being I'm in California, or in the California Exchange, Blue Shield of California, what I've been able to see, or I, I cannot find out if I can go into Arizona. It's, it's not clear. You ask for providers in Arizona and it comes back as an invalid request. Therefore, if I have to stay in California, I have to travel an extra 100 miles, and that's no exaggeration, to access physicians and hospitals. As a veterinarian, I do make a decent living, but after 30 years in practice, I cannot yet afford to retire. Nobody pays for my retirement but myself. No one but me pays for my health insurance. Obamacare is probably not going to bankrupt me, but it will certainly have an effect on my plans for the future. I don't consider myself very old, and I've been fairly healthy my whole life, but about the last five years, that's changed as one gets older. And now when I need my insurance the most, it's being canceled. And I'm no expert in the healthcare industry, but I did serve on a hospital board for 13 years, sitting as chairman for 10. My wife for the last 20 years has been CEO of uh, small rural hospitals. So I'm familiar with the healthcare industry, and I don't think most people are really aware of how deeply and intimately involved the government already is in your healthcare, every aspect of it. Certainly, 
the administration's call for reform is laudable, but in my opinion, the reason the current system is so screwed up is because the government is so involved in it. And reform really should be less involvement of the government rather than more. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Mrs. Hammond. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today on this really very important subject to all of us. My name is Christy Hammond. My husband and I are both self-employed real estate professionals in Prescott, Arizona. I'm 55 years old and he is 58. We've been um, self-employed and self-insured for over 30 years. Our family's been fortunate enough to be in relatively good health. None of us smoke. And so our premiums have always been reasonable. Um, it's been our choice to have health insurance with high deductibles and low premiums. This has worked well for our family. We have insurance presently through Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. We have a $5,000 deductible per person. It's a policy that's designed for relatively healthy people. We have three doctor's visits, so that we get co-pays a year, and um, we're allowed to have a health savings account where we pay for everything as we go meet to the point of that um, deductible. Our premiums this last year have been $550 a month. For my husband and I, we have a college-aged daughter, and we have a 25-year-old son who has yet to have full coverage to have health insurance coverage at his workplace. So I, I would say originally I wasn't particularly enthusiastic about a government-run health care system <laughs> um, or a mandate for insurance, but I understood that a lot of people in this country could not afford adequate health care and um, health insurance. I was sympathetic to this plight. I expected our premiums would rise slightly. I was expecting that. But I had no idea what was about to happen to our family. When President Obama told, repeatedly stated that if we liked our insurance, we could keep it, period, I just didn't imagine what I was about to walk into. And so I received a cancellation letter from Blue Cross Blue Shield in September. I thought, I honestly laid it aside and thought, well, because they said they'll put us in another plan. So I laid it aside and I thought, not a whole lot about it until I finally called my, um, my agent. And he said that we'd be able to move to another Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. And when I talked to him, he said, you'll have far better insurance than you have now, which sounded good. He said I would have maternity coverage and pediatric dentistry, both of which I would have been happy to have back in my childbearing years and child raising years, but I do not need it now. Um, he told us the plan that most resembled our plan would still have a $6,000 deductible per person, but my premium would now be $1,701 a month. To say the least, I was stunned by the increase. My husband and I are both in real estate. We make a good living. We don't know from year to year what that living's going to be, though. So. Upon the advice of a number of people, I was told not to go into the exchange and put in any personal information. But they do have a calculator within the exchange that you can put in some basic information and be given the idea of what your premium would be on the exchange. So I put in there that we made 95000 hypothetical number. There would be no subsidy available if you make over ninety four two. My premium would be $1,387 a month, $16,642 for the year. It's 17.5% of our income, equivalent to our housing allowance. I then estimated that our adjusted gross income, let's say, was $89,000. And I was given an estimate of over $8,000 in subsidies. If I made just under the, if we made just under the 94.2. This would equal 9.5% of our household income. A huge difference for a few thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. If we were to underestimate our adjusted gross and take advantage of the subsidy, we would owe it back if we made over that. With premium increases like this, it's a total game changer for our family. The thought of health care premiums for healthy non-smokers costing between 17 and 20% of our income is truly unbelievable to me. 
We've been offered a reprieve from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona, like the, Mrs. Dalton said, until December of 2014. The letter informing us just came last week. If nothing is done about the effect that Obamacare is having on the self-insured middle class, the next year at this time we'll be looking at these huge premium increases. This could be the first time in our lives that we are left uninsured or making life-changing decisions. This is not what our president promised us. We have worked hard to provide for our family. We've been responsible, we've paid our bills and we pay our taxes. This is not playing out as we were promised. I urge you to make changes to the Affordable Care Act that is proving quite unaffordable for us. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now recognize myself, uh, first of all, for a point of privilege. Uh, I come to Arizona not as often as uh, uh, John McCain comes to San Diego. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I want you to understand we think of him often as our senator. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I come to Arizona often, and I've come here for many, many years. But in the last three years, I've come here more often because of the uh, murder of Brian Terry. In just a few days, we'll have the third anniversary of the killing, the gunning down of Brian Terry with a weapon that was released to the uh, drug cartels uh, as a responsibility of, of federal agents here in Arizona. So uh, I note this day because it is another reason that uh, Arizona is a place that I often find myself. The, uh, the committee is dedicated to a, a lot of areas. Today though, uh, I think there's some questions that need to be asked of, of all four of you as representatives of people simply trying to insure or cover their family's health care. We, each one of you more or less represent, uh, you know, mention the president's if you like your health care. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you all like your health care you had a lot more now that you've seen the alternative? Absolutely. To a certain, I always liked it. Yeah. To a certain extent, weren't we all, and I'm going to ask each of you to answer yes or no, but we all sort of said, boy, we sure like an improvement in health care. We all thought we ought to be able to do better. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen one alternative that apparently isn't better, and it's making us appreciate what we had that, for the most part, Americans always thought we could do better. Would you say that's true, Mrs. Dalton? Yeah, in our case, we really appreciated what we had because Blue Cross um, almost denied me over what they were calling a pre-existing condition, and we were really relieved when we were able to work through that. We got additional documentation, we got you know, and we got the insurance that we wanted. And so for us, from the beginning, we were very appreciative of it. Um, and we're afraid for a moment there, maybe we may not get it. So it really hurts me on a personal level to lose it because I worked so hard to get it. Ms. Robinson, you were previously covered under your husband. And I assume that you had a family policy. So it's only in the last couple of years, I'm assuming, that you've taken the, the lead role in, in having to make these decisions. Uh, what's it been like for you? seeing what you had versus what now you're facing once this short uh, uh, forbearance goes through and 2014 passes. It is very, very scary. Um, I have worked really hard to be able to be retired. I'm 59 years old. I'm going to be 60 in a couple months. You know, all of you are telling us information that we would have guessed much younger. <laughs> oh, your check's in the mail. <laughs> anyway, um, and so now this is putting a crimp on it. And um, it's, I'm scared. When I first got that letter that my insurance was going to go up to 700 and something, I cried because I thought, what am I going to do? I'm, I live modestly. I have a very, I don't know what else I can cut out. Dr. Montgomery, you, you said you kind of liked what you had before and you're a healthcare professional, so uh, you're probably the most knowledgeable, but I'll repeat the question because it's, it's one that for me coming to the field is important to understand. Before 2010 and during the debate, one in which the American Medical Association actually weighed in in favor of the Affordable Care Act, were you of the opinion that health care was a little messed up and we could make it better, and we should? 
Well, first, I'm not a real doctor. I'm a veterinarian. So, um, <laughs> but, but yeah. You know, I mean, you know the, the interesting being, thing is a veterinarian is, is somebody who takes care of mammals in a very, very uh, wonderful way for a lot less than we take care of ourselves. So uh, I'm not sure you should ever sell short being a doctor simply because your patients uh, don't actually write the check. Right. <laughs> but sitting on a hospital board for so long and seeing the interaction of, or the the meddling, you might want to call it, of the federal government. Certainly, there is a need for some of that, but you're dealing with a, with a bureaucracy or an ineptocracy, in my opinion, that doesn't really you know, look at solving the problem. I mean, certainly, here's some rules and guidelines and, that you need to follow, but there, you have to bend those rules now and then to make it fit the patient, so to speak. And you're talking mostly CMS, the That's federal correct. programs oh, yeah, that I your can, hospitals spend I so much time working on. I can tell you stories that just like, what are you people thinking? I mean, it's just, get out of here. Let us, solve, let us deal with this. Let us solve this problem. Um, so yeah, I, but my health insurance, I never really needed it. And I, but I knew it was there. That was the comfort. I knew it was there. And I've lately started to need it, and it's been, it's been good. And now suddenly, after 30 years of paying into it, and I can't have it anymore. I would rather they just left us alone and let us continue on. Mrs. Hammond, I'm going to ask you a, a question because you, you owned up to being, again, much, much older than you look. You're kind. Uh, in, uh, in the early 1960s, just as Medicare was being introduced, the cost of health care was 5% of the nation's spending, or 5% of GDP. Mm -hmm. Today, it's 18% heading toward 20 under Affordable Care Act within a matter of a year or two. And that's not dollars, that's actually the percentage of all of our wealth, meaning that the number you gave is actually pretty predictable, that 20% of, of everything made is going to go toward health care if we don't change the affordable part of, of health care. In your view, and I know the doctor here uh, has a lot of expertise, but in your view, is that what we should take back? Is that we should put affordable into the affordable care uh, promise? Indeed, indeed. We, we, we had a plan that worked for us. The market for plans that work for individuals, that's gone. Now it's one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And we all must pay for what I, we have never paid for in the past. Even in my childbearing years, I didn't have paternity coverage. <laughs> we, you know, we saved and we paid that out of pocket. And if you so, want them bad enough, you'll pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> in, yes, yes. So I think for, for us, because we've been able to choose the kind of plan that works for our family, and now to have that choice taken from us, um, I, I was so surprised. At one point, I, I just wanted to mention, I probably should have put this in my testimony, but um, when I was talking to my agent at Blue Cross, he said, um, I said, $1,700 a month? I, I can't even imagine. He said, well, I, could, I, I suggest you to have your college-age daughter take her off your plan and have her go on access. And I thought, oh, we've always paid our own way. You really want us to put our... Not, it, it just seemed like an absurd solution mm -hmm. that the government is becoming responsible for yet more people mm -hmm. and their health care <laughs> instead of less. Mm -hmm. So, of course, if you took one less commission in that hypothetical situation, yes. stayed and didn't bother to do one, le one right. sale, uh, didn't do one open house that might lead to a sale, you could qualify for $8,000 from your government right. while contributing a fraction less. Right. Mm -hmm. Only in America. Dr. Gosar. Yeah. Um, Ms. Hammond, I want to start with you. Yes. You led right into my, my, my questioning. So um, you sold real estate. Yes. Everybody buys the same house, right? <laughs> no. So you custom that, right? Yes. So there's, there's, there you sit down, you find out what the, their need is, what they can mm -hmm. afford, and you tailor that accordingly, right? Correct. Okay. So what we've seen in, in government's rollout here, whether it be Social Security, whether it be Medicare, whether it be mm -hmm. Medicaid, is a one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been our problem. Yeah. And so now here we got something that's very, very personal. Um, what do you see in this, now that you look at it with a little different rose 
tinted glasses now. Mm -hmm. I know they're not ro rose tinted, but you know, what do you see now and, and what are you suspicious of what's coming? Because you know this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? I think for the first time, and I told you this when I first met you, this is the first time I've contacted my congressman. And I've never felt the need to. But this, I feel as if choices have been taken away from us. Mm -hmm. Choices to do what's best for our family. Mm -hmm. And I think part of, this, of the um, alarming nature of it for us was it came so quickly mm -hmm. because it, it had not been talked about. Until we got those cancellation letters, we didn't really know what was ahead of us. And we were told something that proved to not be true. And I feel like in a community like Prescott, where there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of business there, a lot of self-employed people, a lot of self-insured people. We're speaking for a lot of people just like us in small communities and for the self-employed, so. Dr. Montgomery, I want to get with you. Um, you know, you, you brought up the, the, the portability. You know, you, you travel along that uh, border, and that's where most of my district is uh, venturing from Arizona to California to Nevada. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, Bullhead City is, uh, you know, river divides uh, uh, Bullhead City from Laughlin. And so the hospital's on Arizona side. So this provides a huge problem, and you, you made mention that you would have to drive possibly 100 miles in additional to, to get care. How does that implicate? You sat on a hospital board. How does that implicate health care delivery? Well, <clears throat> for, for emergencies, it's significant. I mean, if, if you have a real bona fide emergency, they're going to have to fly you to a center. Well. That's quite expensive. I mean, it's like $10,000 for a, a helicopter ride. Yeah, it, it, it varies, but I mean, it, it, it's, it's very expensive. I know my stepdaughter um, went in labor. Well, two and a half, well, it should be two and a half hours across the desert. My wife made it, I think, in just under two. <laughs> At midnight on a Friday, um, I, you know, never been in labor, but I can imagine, you know, that type of thing. So um, it, it, you, you don't have specialists in rural areas. If you need to see a specialist, you have to go out of town. And if some specialists will come to the areas, but some don't, but you can travel. Like I said, for us, it's a, to go to Palm Springs, that's where it closes, is over 100 miles. So you're telling me a simple diabetic shock issue could end up in death? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was getting to. Uh, Ms. Ms. Robinson, um, you were talking about employment. Is employment higher out in rural Arizona than in, uh, in good downtown Phoenix or metropolitan areas across the country? Um, if I get an eight dollar an hour job, I will be doing well. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really impacting us, and so mm -hmm. uh, problems uh, in, in actually finding that job. Exactly. Would it would it cause you repose to, to know that since January 1st of this year, the majority of jobs are part-time jobs that are being placed into uh, our economy? I have understood that, and I realize, again, that would probably be the best I could get unless I got two jobs, as I think was stated previously. So, so the big thing that we want to know is that you have to pay for these premiums. So mm -hmm. somebody in our district, um, we're a pretty poor district, the, mm -hmm. the bulk are 80 percent of our seniors are dual eligible, both Medicaid and Medicare dependent. Mm -hmm. So take a family, three of those jobs that the president's talking about, two to pay for full-time wages and one to pay for the benefits. That, that's striking, that's isn't it? It's ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. I wish that Obama could Put him in Kmart. Let him let him see what <clears throat> excuse me what real life is like. He obviously has no clue or doesn't care. I don't know. First lady said they don't do charity. Miss mm -hmm. um, Dalton. Miss Dalton. Uh, um, one last question is is that the access to providers in in Prescott is it greater or less under this uh, unaffordable care act? Oh, it's much less. We had a, our uh, family doctor was in practice for probably 40 years and retired, walked away from his practice, just locked the door and left, didn't even try to sell the practice. 40 years investing in, in, in his 
practice and in his life, and he didn't even try to sell it. We had six doctors. I also lost my same. He, he moved away, moved back east to be closer to family, locked the door on his practice and left. And it took us probably a good eight to ten months to find another doctor. They, either they weren't taking uh, new patients. We finally we see a nurse practitioner in a neighboring city. So it's been significant. The shortage of doctors is significant and notable. Thank you, Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Grosser. Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have some of my staff members here today. Um, Lloyd Bostrom, Lisa Tesler, and Sherry Farrington, and uh, Michael Jameson over here. And along with the wonderful security, part of Michael's job is to keep me from getting shot. And I want to go on record saying I hope he does a very good job. Um, <laughs> But uh, we really are grateful uh, to our staff. And you know, this uh, last uh, few weeks, um, since it's become clear uh, some of the different directions that Obamacare intends to take this nation, there have been a lot of calls coming to our office. And uh, they are quite different in nature, according to my staff, than they were uh, some in months past. You know, we sometimes would get some calls criticizing us for being so vociferously against. Obamacare, and now we're not getting those calls, uh, but we are getting a lot of calls that reflect some of the perspectives that have been articulated here today, and so I'm seeing that happen in a big way. And you know, it occurs to me, Mr. Chairman, that you know the highway of history is littered with the wreckage of socialist uh, enterprises, and yet we seem to the, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history much. It seems like we're not really paying much attention, uh, and ironically. Uh, in this case, as in so many of the others, the ones that they were ostensibly trying to help, the poorest in our society, are the ones that are being hurt the most. And my line of question goes like this, in, in all deference to, to the four of you as witnesses here, you do not represent the poorest in our society. You represent middle class people who are out there getting the job done. And uh, the discussion here has been primarily financial, which is appropriate. But I think there's another aspect here to, uh, to this uh, Obamacare that we really need to look at carefully, and that is what is going to happen to the actual delivery of care. Uh, you know, one of the dynamics in, in a socialist effort, when, when the finances don't add up, when people start complaining of the cost, they start working to diminish the kinds of, of uh, services that are delivered. And that's my greatest concern uh, about this situation is that doctors are simply going to say, forget it, I'm out of here, you know, uh, uh, or that the bureaucrats are going to really make it difficult for, again, those in the lower economic echelons to be able to access care. And so my first question to you is, is Dr. Montgomery, you know, innovation in healthcare, of course, has been one of the things that allows us to give the very best care at the cheapest uh, a cost and maintaining dignity of the patient, which in my judgment is the, is the goal of the healthcare system. Do you think that this is going to have a significant impact uh, ultimately on the kind of care that some of the bureaucrats will allow to be offered, especially with the lower income uh, people that are on the exchanges? Well, that I don't know. Um, first off, no one in this country has denied care. I mean, the current system, I mean, if you show up in the ER, they have to take care of you. But now, um, the people that could not afford it, well, now they're going to be taxed, when before they weren't. So I, I'm not sure how they're going to work that out. Which It seems to me there could be a better way to provide, you know, the whole goal of this was to be able to pay for this. I mean, a lot of hospitals, right, standard at a hospital is to write off 50% of what they charge. I mean, that's standard across the industry. They have about, you know, hospital is very expensive, and, but that's not what they get paid. That's what they charge, but that's never what they get paid. And writing off 50% or more is, is standard. And the burden on the hospitals is these patients that, 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 can, that can't afford to pay because they're still required to take care of them. How that's going to work out, I, I really don't know. But I, I can't see that any other way that it's like care is going to be delimited in some fashion because... Um, I think fewer people are going to be able to pay for it. Um, and the government's supposed to step in and do that, but I, I don't see 
any more money coming in for that. That's what the attempt is here, but I don't think it's going to happen. So I, I really don't know. I mean, it, that's the frightening part to me is like, what's going to happen in a couple of years? Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, I guess the, the next area, then that may be a, the question may be a little premature. I am afraid that as we go forward, we're going to find not only is the affordable care unaffordable, but it's not very caring either. And uh, I'm hoping that we can keep our eye on that because, after all, isn't that the fundamental goal of health care? Sometimes I'm always amazed that our friends on the left who say that this is for the poor uh, forget how bad sometimes this actually hurts the poor. And I would like next uh, time we have another uh, round, Mr. Chair, to, to discuss some of the differences in the deductibilities or the trend there because I think that will be the other area they'll try to make up uh, cost. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Swiker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in a series of, of different topics, um, and Ms. Dalton, you almost started to cry and started to make me cry. That's just not fair. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the tissue, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's a loving, loving group around here. Um, as you were starting to touch on, and Ms. Robinson also touched on, where you are income-wise, and, and I don't want you to share that you know, on record, but uh, you, as you started to tear up and walk through the impact it's having on you and your family's life, part of what I think you were trying to share, or, and I don't let me put words in your mouth, is you're almost being boxed in, incentivized, forced to say, if I will make less money, if I will gain my life, I get this money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet you sounded very... Um, as, as, as I hope everyone is, uh, prideful, respectful, that you did not want to take that subsidy. Am I being fair? That's right. We don't want to take a subsidy. We didn't spend all those years in school to become, my husband, to become proficient in a trade just so that he could take a subsidy. That's not, that's not what we want. And frankly, we, ha we find it abhorrent that we would spend that much time become self-reliant only to then burden our children and our grandchildren to pay for something which two months ago we were handling just fine. And then to go find out that if, even if we did have no problems ideologically with the exchange, even if we were comfortable with that, to, to find out that we go on and we only get $250 worth of help, it's still, what are we going to do? We can't afford the exchange. We can't afford individual policies. What, Medicaid, is that where we're headed? Being professionals and well-educated professionals and now we're being, why is it that the, ins, that the government ha, is, has transformed itself into an instrument of plunder? It's it, taken from us and you're hitting our plan. Hey, look, you're approaching a very powerful point here. And Ms. Hem? Yes. Um, and I wanted to make sure because um, Chairman Issa started to touch on it, but that everyone sort of understands the math and I'm doing this as you were sort of sharing. If you'll make $6,000 less, mm -hmm. you get 8,100, was it 167? Yeah, right, 8,000. Okay. So, so you're literally, so if you'll manage your life, so when you've hit your income, you just stop. You actually exactly. make money by mm -hmm. minimizing your productivity. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, it, the absurdity of it. And, and look, from, as Daryl, when he introduced me, you know, we spend a lot of our time fixated on economic growth in our office and, and mm -hmm. how to do this. And this is going to be probably the next set of hearings we're going to have to hold in the beginning of the year of what it's doing there. Um, Dr. Montgomery, mm -hmm. and remember, the GPA for vet students is substantially higher than um, human medical schools. We so, like to think so. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, that's what all my vet friends tell me. <laughs> particularly when they're handing me their bill. Um, it, 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 it's, now you've been on a hospital board. Mm -hmm. So you, but the hospital was actually on the um, California side of the yeah. Colorado River. Yeah. So you were under Medi-Cal. Um, in Arizona, we have the Arizona Access. Healthcare Cost Containment System, which we call Access, mm -hmm. which is a little unique because we fun functionally buy capitated HMO policies. Yeah, I'm, the, not, I'm not that familiar with the, how it works. But well, similar well the, programs. The data that's been presented to our offices recently, um, in, in, back in September when we were trying to grind through how to get this message out, is that in just a couple years, the doctors who were at the hospital you were on the board on 
will be paid more to see a Medicaid patient, an access patient, than a Medicare patient and much of the compensation that will actually come through, um, I, I understand some of the exchange providers. Mm. It's almost a perversity where now you're, you know, the, the adjustments on compensation, you're almost being incentivized to push people to go on to those subsidies. Right, like a single payer system. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, which um, who knows whether that's ultimately where we've been being driven. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will yield back. Well, Dave, I, I want to thank you. And, and it's interesting, the other day, uh, this week, we had a hearing that was on the Affordable Care Act, but it was really on government intervention, what the effects were. And I was shocked that my ranking member and a couple colleagues on that side, they actually started saying single payer under their breath, uh, which I felt perfectly willing to, to mention, because that's what they really wanted. That was what they wanted. It just, this was their incremental step. Uh, and it's a little surprising to some people, but that actually is what my members, Democratic members, said during an open hearing. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, be that it may, if that's what they wanted, wouldn't it have been nice if they had actually been truthful about that? Uh, well, Mr. Kucinich was, but for the most part, yeah, others were not. Were not. Uh, doctor, I'm going to recognize myself for a short second round. Uh, be, having been on a hospital board, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take hospitals to task for a moment because it, there are two areas that concern me that are affecting government intervention today, and they came out of our hearing earlier. One was that uh, the federal government currently pays more for the exact same procedure if you do it in a hospital than in a doctor's office or a clinic. Are you aware of that? No, I was not aware of that. Uh, it's the reason that in urban areas, including San Diego, uh, large amounts of clinics are closing and doctors are being bought into hospital practices so they can do the exact same procedure. And by the way, if they do it under certain rules, they may still be doing it in the clinic, but the clinic is now considered a hospital. So what you end up with is the federal government simply reimbursing at a higher level. Uh, and you have an experience with that. You've seen, I gather, from your earlier comments, that the existing federal programs, Medicare and Medicaid being the largest, they often cause you to make decisions because you can get paid more for doing it one way than doing it another. Isn't that true? Oh, absolutely. You, you talk about the, the DRGs <clears throat> coding to diagnose related groups. I mean, it's a, it's a game. A patient comes in with a problem. Well, don't diagnose it as that. Diagnose it as this because you get reimbursed more for it. And, I mean, hospitals are very labor intensive, so they have, to, they have to pay all these nursing staff because federal mandates require, you know, a certain level of staffing, which may or may not be realistic. Um, and so it's just a big game that they all play, and they all, everybody knows they're playing it. It's just it's a, it's a game that they play. Talking to some physicians, a lot of physicians don't want to go into private practice because of all the rules and the regulations and the paperwork. They just want to practice medicine, so they're going to work at hospitals. They just get to practice medicine, and the hospital handles all the paperwork. Getting, I mean, if I may of divert a bit, getting back to, to Mr. Frank's question, as an example, and I'll use this, this has really happened, but as an example of the thinking on the federal side, there's a small rural hospital. They don't have a full-time surgeon. The surgeon comes from another town about 50 miles away. A larger hospital, there are multiple surgeons. In terms of level of care, the small rural hospital is a primary care facility. This other hospital is like a secondary care facility. The surgeon is in the small town performing surgery, and he receives a call from the other hospital. Hey, we have a boy that needs an appendectomy. You know, this is an emergency. Can we ship him down and you can do it down there? Sure, send him on down. Okay, that's breaking rule number one. So the boy arrives, the doctor's in surgery, he tell, he, he's talking through his mask, admit the boy, da da da. You know. So they admit him into the hospital, into a bed. As soon as he's ready, they wheel him and they do the appendectomy. That's breaking rule number two. The CMS had a conniption fit over this because you're breaking That's two a technical term. What, conniption fit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because you're basically breaking two rules. Number one, never in any case should you send from a 
a, a secondary care hospital a case to a primary care hospital. I mean, that's, why would you? There's more care, there's more availability of care, there's a, a greater level of care there. Second, it's an emergency. He can't be admitted to the hospital. He has to go through the emergency room and wait there and then go in. You don't get admitted till after surgery. But it's more expensive to go through the ER. And we, he's already had all the blood work and the diagnosis. We're just getting the bed ready and as soon as we're ready, we'll wheel him on in. The care providers were more than happy to provide the care and were diligent in doing so. But the federal bureaucrats that got onto this, I mean, it lasted for months, phone calls, emails. I mean, just crazy because you didn't follow the rules. And I, you know, but, but we solved the problem. We, 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 we resolved the issue. Doesn't matter, you didn't follow the rules. So the problem with the federal government is that rules based rather than common sense by the actual sort of Right, and so I, I can't see if the federal government now, is, I can only see the delivery of care from that side going down. Well, let me ask one more question, and you may know it uh, more, better than the others. Uh, under the Affordable Care Act, there's an elimination of physician-owned hospitals. They're no longer allowed. Uh, is Arizona an area in which, particularly in rural areas, physician-owned hospitals are often, or in, in even suburban, often part of the solution historically? I, I really, I've only been associated with uh, public hospitals or corporate-owned hospitals and never physician-owned. Here in, Arizona, in Phoenix, you do have the Mayo Clinic annex, right? Um, well, I said I'm from Blythe, uh, California, but I, uh, yes. Funny thing is, the Mayo Clinic, I understand, was the Mayo Brothers, wasn't it? It, 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 was, it was physicians caring enough to start a hospital. And with that, I go back to Dr. Gosar. Um, this is just perfectly leading in. So, um, uh, Dr. Montgomery, so you're aware that what's coming down the road. I mean, I'm not going to make this easy for people because a number of our, you know, uh, folks coming forward, this is your first dealing talking to Congress and talking about government. So there's things like the SGR. Sustainable growth rate. Are you familiar with that? Not. It's not actually by that compensating term. physicians right. that aren't compensated originally because the government underpays them. Right. Okay. We owe something like 180 billion to that. Wherever you can find that chump change around. Okay. We also have an IPAB board, which gets me back to your conniption fit. Okay. So you're going to have unelected bureaucrats coming together to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. So redefining choice again to each of the, the ladies that we're talking about earlier, okay? Um, I also want to ask you, where in this bill was there tort reform? Are you familiar with any No, I, I never read it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that you, even if you did, we were having a conversation. But, but, but I'm aware did, that it's not there. There is not. There is not. Uh, and, and, and so I guess my, my, my point to get to here is, is that I, I'm one. I'm a dentist. I, I believe that we need to have health insurance reform, but we need something different. And we just had this hearing on Wednesday, and the chairman said I was having way too much fun. And so I'm going to have a little more fun today, okay? It's because there's opportunities to get back to square one. Number one is it has to be patient-centered, patient-friendly, because that's what we're talking about. You want your doctor to epitomize what's special about each one of you and direct a, um, a, and choreograph a health care that's based off of you. And I'm going to pick on myself. I'm allergic to wheat. They had some nice donuts today. I abstain because I'm allergic to wheat, okay? I want a healthcare industry that comes to me and says, Dr. Gosar, because you're allergic to wheat, you have a seven day greater chance of getting any type of lymphoma. And we know that lymphomas are easily di diagnosed early on. So how about Dr. Gosar, if we have you, you know, doctors don't live by their own rules. I mean, we're the worst patients ever. But if you were to get a, 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 you know, a diagnostics, twice in three years, we're going to give you incentivizing. Does that sound rational to you folks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's where you want to go. This is what doesn't make sense about this law, is common denominators, is, is that I want the insurance company to work for me, not to work for the man, not to work for the government, which is what they do right now, okay? Look at your plans, they're all the same. Mm -hmm. I want them tailored made to me, okay? That's called reform and repeal of McCarran-Ferguson. The only person talking about that in, there in, in Congress Right here. What it does is allows the federal government to break up the insurances to make them compete just like we as doctors do. Wouldn't that be something, Doc? I actually have them competing for our business. 
What's that? It is true. Number two is. Uh, number two I, is I apologize, but only, only the witnesses We want respond. to make sure that we have the opportunity to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. No, it's perfect information. Only the, only the witnesses in the we dais want to have on, during a hearing, please. We reform that gets everybody on the playing field. So what we have coming, and we want tax reform, that your money is better spent accordingly. So that is why there is opportunities to make something better. Health care isn't a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not an independent issue. It's an American issue. And what we've got is a failing system. I said it earlier, Medicare is failing, Medicaid's failing, Social Security is failing because government hasn't looked at the parameters of increasing age, increasing technology, and not working with us accordingly. Part of that responsibility is also us as citizens for not holding elected officials accountable. And that's why I complimented on you folks for coming out today and holding us accountable, because that's what you need to do. That is a very, very important aspect. So um, the real quick question, Mrs. Dalton, um, in regards to what I was just talking about, this iPad board that will restrict what you can actually have and, and do, how is that going to hurt uh, your options in, in rural Arizona and Prescott? Um. I'm not sure I understand the question. So if, if what they're going to do is limit the, what you can actually provide services for, um, and now you have fewer services being provided and fewer companies providing, mm -hmm. is that going to make it cheaper or more expensive? Oh, it's much, it makes it much more expensive. In fact, my agent told me that because of the demographics of where we live, that getting this, the same procedure done in Yavapai County is two or three hundred dollars more expensive than if we were to come down to Maricopa County. So there's a huge disparage, disparity there. Um, even on the exchanges, they're much cheaper to enter in Phoenix than they are for us in, in Prescott. How would you feel, Mrs. Robinson? I would feel the same. I, I, we're very limited. The same? Yes, I, I mean, we have limited health providers, and I think it will only become more of a problem as we move forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think it's important sometimes to, to try to come back to earth and ask ourselves what is the overall, ultimate, overarching goal of health care policy? And isn't it to try to see everyone be able to have the best health care at the least cost that, that it maintains their dignity as much as possible? And, and I think that's the real question. Sometimes I'm, I'm afraid that uh, our friends on the left would say, well, you know, everyone has a right to health care. But what they really mean is that I have a right to make you pay for my health care. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ultimately doesn't work out very well. It's it, it, uh, e even if there's a, uh, a basic disconnect, it, it doesn't work out well in practice. You know, uh, in England, in England, uh, Mr. Chairman, they have uh, a government-controlled health care system. And uh, if you have a cold, you call a doctor. If you have cancer or heart problems, you call a travel agent. Uh, you want to get out of there and come where they can help. And uh, there is now an effort among the, the, the people there to kind of go around the system to try to let. And that leaves, unfortunately, most of the poorest people in the society that are the least capable of doing these things uh, sort of at the mercy of the government system. And Dr. Gosar's point about IPAB, I, I, iPad, IPAB, I think, is the biggest single consideration here. Uh, just as free enterprise sometimes is criticized, Mr. Chairman, as being the unequal distribution of wealth, socialism has always been the equal distribution of poverty. And I am concerned that in this desire to make universal health care at government to, under government control for universal health care, we're going to have, um, instead of the unequal distribution of the best health care sometimes, which I wish we could, we could fix, we're going to have the equal distribution of poor health care. And uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, it has a greater impact on our society as well. In Europe, you know, the, their poverty, I'm sorry, our poverty level is their average income. And so I, I just have to say to you, I don't know where we're headed here, and it looks to me like uh, it's really dangerous for us to suggest that a government that cannot build a website is all of a sudden now capable of handling the entire complexity of the healthcare system. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the bottom line here is I, I think that the government's going to have to try to create ways to make the numbers that don't work, work. And we've already heard about the premiums. So I'd like to ask each of the witnesses, what do they think that their opinions are 
related to the deductibilities that will be in these healthcare systems, and of course, Dr. Gosar's point of the kinds of healthcare that might be restricted to reduce the costs in an inefficient government-run system. Uh, could you suspend for just a moment? I, I'd like to announce to the audience, perhaps I should have been more strict early on, this is a federal government hearing under the rules that we all live under. So please, no response from the audience. We would appreciate your continued understanding that this is an exchange simply between members on the dais and the witnesses. And, and I would ask everyone to respect that or to leave the room. I thank you. You may answer. You had the question. Yeah. Uh, just, just was wanting to ask the witnesses to to tell me, it, as you, as you know, again, it may be a premature question. We know about the premium uh, impact, the sort of the sticker shock on the premium. But what about? Uh, it seems to me that one of the next steps will be to to try to increase the deductibilities and try to ameliorate the premium issue, and um, and then ultimately to try to restrict care to make the numbers work. Do any of you have any insight on the deductibility? Uh, issues. Well, I know for us the plan that we were told, we were told the one that we had originally chosen was gone and it didn't exist anymore. We had chosen a high deductible plan um, and the one that was quoted to us as being closest to what we already had was that 320 percent increase in premium and the deductible was was lower. So they're trying to kind of recoup things there. As far as um, uh, quality of care, I think it's premature for me to say I, I don't know what kind of quality of care we might see if it'll be you know reduced or not, but I can say that since our doctor of 12 years retired, we've had to settle for a nurse practitioner in a neighboring city. And you know she's a fine human being, but it's, it's not the relationship we once had. It's not the, it's not the expertise that we once enjoyed. And so I can only, I can only think that um, perhaps that might be the trend. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes. If anyone else has any particular insight, no? No. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Swarker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, but leading right off of um, where Trent was, uh, Ms. Hamm, uh, yes. when you looked at your alternatives and policies, um, did you maintain the relationship with your same doctor? Um, if I stay with Blue Cross Blue Shield, which we live in, you know, in a small town, Blue Cross Blue Shield is accepted by most doctors. Okay. Um, Dr. McGovern. That, uh, again, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't been able to. Well, you have, a, you have a unique geographic issue, which actually is going, which is fascinating for actually a number of our communities out here in the West, uh, where you cross state jurisdictions. Correct. And I don't know the answer. I haven't been able to find out for sure. I just know when I accessed Blue Shield of California, which was the provider of most of the plans available, and, I, and put in, you know, look for providers, and you put in the zip code of the town, it says not a valid address. And I'm not certain if the doctors in the Arizona side will take that or not, or if they'll be allowed to. I, I just don't know. It, it's, it's a, we will have staff but start that's certainly that that, That's of concern to me. I mean, if, if they do, it's maybe not that big an issue. Mm -hmm. But I do know that the premium is going up and the out-of-pocket is going, is going to go up. Okay. Uh, Ms. Robinson, I know you spent some time looking at what your alternatives were. Um, and I accept in, in rural Arizona you have a lot fewer medical professionals. Were you able to keep the individuals you have relationships with? I called my... Um, clinic and they're not totally sure. Okay. So Ms. I don't know yet. And Ms. Dalton? I have not inquired into that. I, I, like Mrs. Hammond, I just have assumed that, you know, being Blue Cross Blue Shield, everyone takes them. I don't think there will be changes in the doctor that we have to see at this point. Okay. It's just a question of how we're going to be able to afford to pay for it. It is. Um, we, we actually have sort of some interesting numbers that we've been working on. Um, as we started to touch on before, in Arizona, we, uh, our Medicaid system is called Access, and it looks like folks enrolled in Access plans will actually have more medical choices than a lot of us who maintain private insurance. That's um, not yeah, which is which is a sort of a fascinating irony. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, doctor, um, sorry, you have sort of a unique uh, 
um, situation because you've lived within some of the bureaucracy. Um, have you, you know, when you, when you talk to folks, because obviously you've, you're from the medical, um, you've been on the hospital board, are you running into other discussions about keeping my doctor, the cost, um, the portability, my, the, those relationships? Well, I've been off the board for about five years, so, um, oh, but in talking to people in the community, that, yes, that is a concern, um, but that is a concern of people, yes. Okay. But I'm, I'm not certain what effect it's having directly, you know, the nuts and bolts and numbers. No, I don't know. Okay. Ms. Hammond? Um, it, okay, you were buying directly from um, Blue? From? A Blue Cross Blue Shield? Yes. Okay. Had you looked at any other, were there any other opportunities for you? Um, the Realtors Association, anything else you were able to find out? Well, it's where, how we started with Blue Cross Blue Shield. Is originally, there, it, it started many years ago as a plan that we came in through the Association of Realtors. Um, so you, you, you actually beat me to it because that's how my wife and I were carrying ours for a long time. Right, right, right. So, um, and I think there was a 5% discount back then. It's not there now. So, and what other alternatives did you look at? Well, in our panic, we have a January one renewal. So when I got that letter at the end of September, I had to have something in place by January 1st. And so in my panic of trying to find health care and realizing what this is now meaning for our family and the, and the changes, um, we looked at United Healthcare and um, and Blue Cross; those are what we were spending some time on. We were desperately trying to see if we could get on a plan that would start sometime in December in '13. Okay. That would buy us a year, and gratefully, Blue Cross Blue Shield extended so, our plans because of that. But that was just last week we got those letters. And, and that least so for the next 12 months. We have be. 12 months of reprieve here, but okay. we will be looking at these numbers if nothing's changed. All right, and Mr. Chairman, knowing the rule that when the yellow light's on, talk faster, um, it, believe it or not, that's what we say. Um, you know, what, one of the things that, that I, I want to make sure whoever is trying to get their heads around the size and scale of this issue, much of the last month we've all fixated on, oh, thank you. <laughs> it, we have fixated on the website. The website was worthy of talking about because it was a very easy discussion of a point of access, you know, a point to get there. But it is a tiny issue in the scale of what we're talking about. Um, you know, I know Dr. Gosar has been absolutely a champion on the mechanics of how do we access our doctors, how do we make it affordable, those things. Um, many of us have been trying to fixate on what does it do in the cascade effect of economic growth. We're just starting to learn. Literally every day, we run into someone who throws a new wrinkle in crossing state lines. Um, e even for members like us who've spent the last couple years doing town halls talking about what was coming, and forgive me, having people from the audience yelling at us that we weren't telling the truth, and the truth is here. You know, w we said this was coming, and it showed up. Now we would love to have our brothers and sisters on the other side actually be willing to work with us instead of just saying no. Um, and with that, yield back. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. I thank you for your closing remarks. Mr. Gosar, do you have any closing comments? Well, I'm glad that everybody's out here. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, we'd love to have a bigger venue to have more people come. But um, I think this is a venue that uh, you can start to hear some of your, your colleagues um, and your constituents uh, uh, about actual complaints about what's transpiring. I hope that you'll take the opportunity and come to a town hall someday or come out to coffee with your congressman and bring your, your notebook and your ideas because um, one of the things that I will tell you I'm, I look forward to is, is reaching out to you because Congress doesn't know all the right answers. I think the, all the right answers are right outside, right out there in the, in the gallery. Um, we just need to be able to come forward and I want to applaud um, Ms. Hammond, uh, Ms. Dalton, Ms. Robinson, and, and Dr. Montgomery for coming forward and, and sharing your stories. Last two things is, is um, starting January 1st, the definition of full-time work now is 30 hours a week, not, not anything above, 30 hours a week. So this is going to change. Next year we see the employer mandate um, start complying just like the individual mandate, so this becomes compounded. 
So everything that you're witnessing as individuals, and you'll see now on the employer side, no, pay, no people are barred from that, that ex, ex, extravaganza. So thank you very much for coming thank out you. here. Thank you, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you first, Mr. Chairman, uh, for this hearing. I think it's uh, been a great hearing, and I'm also always grateful to be on the same dais with my other colleagues here. I want to thank uh, the people that provided our security and just all of you that uh, came here today. With all of the, the differences that we have, it's probably important to remind ourselves that true tolerance is not in pretending we have no differences. It's being kind and decent to each other in spite of those differences and trying to search for the truth the, the best that we can. Because um, this ideal of America is unique in the history of the world and we are the most blessed people I believe on the planet. And I believe that we will find our way through these, these challenges. But it's probably important to remind us, uh, remind ourselves that this notion uh, of the reason that governments are instituted among men is to protect those things like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those seem like uh, simple concepts, almost uh, passe concepts, but they are the foundation of everything because they incent productivity and they are the concepts that are the ones that have dragged more of the poor people of this country out of poverty and into uh, the, the best lifestyle that any people have ever had than any other system. And it's important that we don't jettison that now. And uh, the reason that this issue of Obamacare has been so significant is because it is the antithesis of this idea of a free, noble, and in, in, uh, uh, productive people that are responsible and move forward to do the best they can while doing everything that we can to look after our brothers and sisters as we go. Uh, that is the, the great miracle of America. And I think it's not time to raise the white flag yet, but recent situations do remind us that we better be very vigilant in the elections and in the, the policies that we move forward on in the future. Thank you all very much for being here, and thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would like to also echo the co earlier comments of, uh, I want to thank uh, our witnesses. I certainly want to thank our, our audience for being respectful. Uh, I appreciate our host, uh, including uh, law enforcement here today uh, for hosting this, uh, this hearing. I'm going to close with something that I, I'm taking home as a takeaway from all four of you. To the greatest extent possible, it appears as though your reprieve is simply signing up to last year's plan and extending it for most of next year. Mm -hmm. That means that there's a time bomb ticking on our witnesses here today, one that does not get them past December 31st of next year. And when full implementation of the Affordable Care Act goes into effect uh, on the last day of, of January or December, just three days before if we're reelected, we would be sworn in, it will be too late to save the programs that you're in many cases staying extended in. Additionally, the way the law worked, the calculations of all the benefits and cost were based on an assumption that you would not stay in your old plan. The old plans that in some cases you're extending are less expensive, but it means that that savings that you're enjoying, and rightfully so, means that a similar cost by you're not going into the other plan, meaning that these federally subsidized plans are going to be more expensive as a result or lose money. That recognition is in stark contrast to something that we who have worked in the, uh, as federal employees are aware of. FEHBP, the, um, the system that every federal employee and postal worker has access to, will be going up by modest amounts this year. The eight million men and women who work for the federal government, and, the, and including the post office, will get as much as 82% of that cost reimbursed but those programs are less expensive than any of the programs you hear today testify that you're going to be forced into next year. That concerns me that the program that the President of the United States is in, FEHBP, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel, and all the way up and down the line of, as I said, all federal civilian employees are in, is currently affordable and, in fact, stable. It is my goal to try to use the contrast over the next few months, along with the committees that many of us serve on, to begin offering comprehensive alternatives that are free market 
and that will hopefully give you the kinds of programs you want, which may not include your care for things that you don't have and don't want. And uh, that's going to be a goal. I'm going to close by saying I respect the Supreme Court even if I don't believe I would make the same decision if I were honored to be on the court. We will also hold this president accountable that he has to respect the body we serve in. And we will do everything we can to try to encourage meaningful change and reform that will lead to affordable care for the American people and to the greatest extent possible, private choice, something that I believe Americans believe, believe is fundamentally one of their greatest rights. And with that, we stand adjourned.